Hi, everybody. This is Joe Hage. I have the privilege of leading your medical devices group, which, as of this recording, has 354,000 members worldwide. But we've moved off LinkedIn. We now live at medicaldevicesgroup.net, where we have plenty of great functionality and we're building even more. I look forward to your suggestions. Today's guest host, you know him, you love him, Robert Packard. He is going to teach us today about how to prepare a medical device 510k submission for the FDA. I will put myself on mute. It's Robert's show. We're just living in it. Rob, take it away. Thank you, Joe. Today's presentation, uh, I realized when I started updating slides that there's no possible way for me to include everything you need to know in a 510k in one of these slide decks. I might have tried a couple of years ago, but now I'm not even going to bother. Um, what I am going to try to do is try to give you uh, pointers to the latest updates that you might not be aware of. And uh, almost everything in this slide deck is new stuff. So uh, I've tried to provide a lot of hyperlinks. Um, we offer, uh, we, we taught a course last year or earlier this year in Las Vegas. We taught one for the second time in Amsterdam just recently. Um, in the talk at the beginning of the session, we were talking about Ireland. We went to Amsterdam and then we went to Ireland uh, for vacation, but Amsterdam was where we taught a workshop. But for those of you that weren't able to go to one of those sessions, we also offer an online version. So if you click on the hyperlink at the top of the slide deck, and Joe said he's going to provide the slide decks, um, you'll be able to actually get a hold of, uh, I think I've got about 30 different webinars recorded now uh, that are in that um, included in this content, plus a book uh, in electronic format, plus all the templates that we use every day for our submissions. So you actually get the templates that we use every single day, not some other version. I only have one version, the one I use every day, and we are constantly updating it. So I'm if you're interested in content- really quickly. I'm gonna interject that uh, I just brought Rob on to a project. It's actually our first time working together. And the first thing that he did for this company that's looking to do a 510K was provide this Dropbox folder of, I don't know how many different folders there were about what to put where. I was so impressed. It's like, this is so organized. Um, and well, that's Rob for you. I'll put myself on mute again. Thank you, Joe. That's that's exactly how we work. Everything's in Dropbox folders. Um, the employees that I've hired, I have four full-time employees and one part-time employee. The full-time employees are extremely organized administrative experts. Um, all of them come from other backgrounds except for Mary Vodder. Mary Vodder is a biomedical engineer. She'd done 510K submissions and CE marking before, but the rest of them were coming to this new. And so they had done similar administrative work before, but they hadn't done it for medical device companies. So I trained them and that is a testament to this training program works, but it's taken a year plus for them to become experts. So Every single form that we have, they're always commenting on, this should be better, this should be changed, this should be more organized. We have a new guidance, we need to update it. So they're constantly telling me what things need to be changed and updated. And when they don't understand something, we record another webinar. So we're constantly updating our webinars, constantly updating the content. And then we pass it off to the clients, but it's always done the same way. So that way, um, we know it's gonna work for you because we're personally using it every day. And when I say every day, There'll be a slide here later where you get an idea of what I mean by how much we do every day. The first questions that every company wants to know, uh, or at least the CEO of every company wants to know is, how long is this gonna take and how much is it gonna cost? Every other question is a detail that um, the regulatory and quality people and the engineers worry about, but the senior management of the company, they're worried about how long, how much money. So in general, about Nine months is how long it takes to get through the process from when you first decide, hey, we're gonna do this product and we're going to uh, get a 510K for it, so what is the regulatory pathway to the point where you actually have the 510K in your hands. Now, can it be longer? Sure, it can be a lot longer. Can it be shorter? Maybe. Uh, it depends on how much testing you've gotten done. The testing is the key to everything, but the way this process would work is we have down here 60 to 75 days under the development phase. That period of time is the amount of time that you wait for the FDA to schedule a pre-sub meeting. 
So when you have a design process for a medical device, your first step is creating a plan. Your second step is approving your design inputs. A lot of companies don't do a good job of design inputs. The design input should be all the regulatory requirements, all your testing requirements. And once you've come up with that test plan, you submit it to the FDA as a pre-sub along with additional questions, and they take 60 to 75 days to give you that meeting. Once you have that meeting and you confirm all the testing plan that you've come up with, then you can actually start doing testing. But you might not have finalized the design yet. The way a lot of startups do it is they'll come to me with a finished product that they want to take to market and they haven't done any testing or sometimes they've done testing but the wrong testing and they'll want my opinion. Well, what my opinion is six months ago we should have had a pre-sub with the FDA to make sure you did the right testing and hopefully they design their device so it will pass that testing. So if you're interested in this process, um, one of the things you can look at is a webinar that I did. Uh, I actually recorded it last week on risk management. So that link is at the bottom. This has all been updated for the new risk management standard that was released as a draft in July. It's going to be a brand new 14971 standard in at the end of 2019. But we've already updated it all for the new European requirements as well as these draft standards. So that's integrated into this. You decide the design inputs here. You have a design review meeting here where you approve your design outputs. That's a, where it says be, begin 510K. That's what, also what we call design freeze. This is the point at which it gets expensive. Once you freeze the design, you start doing testing. The testing is the most expensive part of the process. It's not the FDA fees. It's not my fees. It's, it's not your design team. It's the testing. The testing is the most expensive part. So when you start that testing, you have reached design freeze. That should take you around 100 days. So the title of my book for a 510K is How to Prepare Your 510K in 100 Days. Not because it takes that long. I can do it in 72 hours, but it takes 100 days because you do it in parallel with the testing. So you come up with a plan, you execute the plan, and you write the 510K as they're doing the testing. Once all the testing is done, that last test report comes in, you submit, usually the same day. So it shouldn't be, we finished all our testing, now let's go find a consultant to help us with a 510K. The 510K itself, they say it's going to take 90 days. The average is about 120. The fastest I've seen one is eight days. The longest I've seen one is 600-something days. So you can really screw it up. You can have it go really well. The average is 120. So what should you tell your management? And it's going to take 120 days from the day we submit it. It's going to take about 100 days for testing. And we need to have a pre-sub as early as possible. So those are your answers on how long. Then how much? Well, I have the FDA fees right here for you. They go up a little bit, a few percentage every year. The standard fee went up a lot last year because they had renegotiation of the user fees with Congress. Uh, they have a special committee between industry and the FDA. And what they agreed on is we'd keep the small business fees really low, but we would increase the user fee for standard fees substantially in order to fund getting you faster review times. So their goal is charge more money to staff our teams so we can review your 510K faster. So you can see the pricing here, 10,953 is the standard fee, 2,738 is the small business fee, but you have to get your small business fee, uh, small business qualification every year. For the regulatory consulting fees, um, I have my fees here. I have actually have a standard pricing sheet, so you can see what our standard prices are. They are definitely below the market, but the reason why they're below the market is we do more than just about anybody. So Robert, team. Yep. I just I just learned from Aaron that uh, they see you and not your slides, even though I can. So I'm interrupting. Oh if anybody else is having that problem, the fact that I can see them, I'm thinking others can. Okay, Graham can see the slides. Okay, lots of people can see them. So Aaron, uh, yep, everyone seems to be seeing them. I'm not sure. You might want to click oh. on the little snowflake. You do, have the a, you do have the slide deck as a PDF that I emailed you. You can email it to her, Joe, uh, and yep. she can follow along. We're on slide yep. four now. Yes, and I'll, of course, uh, we'll have the recording. Of course. I'll try to see as I go along what slide I'm on. Maybe that'll help a little bit. Yep, um, it seems as though most people can see it. Uh, please proceed. Okay, so as I said, the smallest fees are the FDA and 
whoever is helping you prepare your 510k. The expensive fees are the testing. So biocompatibility, you need to get a quote from a lab because it changes over time, but a recent quote I got was around $13,000, and that was the bare minimum of testing. Electrical safety and EMC testing, I've seen estimates as low as 40, but when all the testing's done and they've had to repair some things and do some retests and write a report, um, typically you're seeing 50, 60,000 for electrical safety and EMC testing. Your benchtop testing, you might be able to do it in-house. You might have to outsource it to a lab. It depends on what your device is. If you have to do cyclic testing of an orthopedic implant, you're looking at tens of thousands of dollars and it's gonna take a while. Animal testing, if I try to avoid animal testing whenever we can, but some devices like a hemostatic agent where you're trying to stop bleeding, we try not to have volunteers that want to cut themselves and bleed to death. So unfortunately, we demonstrate those with animal testing. We try to use as few animals as possible, but by the time you hire the lab, uh, purchase the animals, take care of the animals, get them used to their environment, um, monitor the animals, feed them, take care of them, then prepare the, for the lab, do the lab, euthanize the animals, and write up your report, you're looking at 100,000 easily. And it all depends on how many animals you have. And then if you're doing a clinical study, I have seen some that are hundreds of thousands of dollars for a very small study. I have also seen a $3 million study that was more like five, 600 patients. So I think a million plus is a good estimate if you're looking for a ballpark but it really depends on how many patients and how many follow-up time points. And yes, some 510Ks do have clinical studies. It depends on the claims you wanna make and what that device is doing. So when you look at all those testing costs, they dwarf all the other costs. So those are the big money items. And that's why it's so important that you come up with your test plan early and review it with the FDA and a pre-sub so you don't have to redo some of that work because that's the expensive part. Here's the official 510K process timeline for the FDA. As I said, sometimes there are delays and the average is about 120 days. But what's supposed to happen is you submit your 510K um, by an e-copy. The day they receive it, later on in that afternoon, you should get a confirmation that the e-copy was successfully uploaded. If you have an extremely large submission, it can take as long as a week. So there are some extra information you need to know about that to make large submissions go in faster. Once you've submitted it and the e-copy is successfully uploaded, then you have the RTA screening. RTA stands for refusal to accept. The FDA implemented in 2012 a program for screening 510Ks because they felt a lot of submissions were not adequate quality. And in those cases, they're they have a, a junior reviewer in some cases reviewing the submission, going through a checklist. It's um, over 20 pages, I believe. I think 26, 27 pages, and they check and make sure all the items are there. And once they've made sure everything is there, then you get an acceptance from the RTA screening. More than 50% of the submissions are rejected during that RTA screening. So they ask for things to be corrected in the submission or missing things to be added, and you restart the clock at zero. Once you get through the RTA screening process, now you are in the formal review uh, which we call the substantive review. For the next 45 days, you're not gonna hear much from the FDA. When you do hear something, it's gonna be one of two things. I need more information, that's an AI request or additional information request, or number two, you're in the um, interactive review. I had a client just recently get that email and they were like, what does this mean? Is this bad? And I'm like, no, that's actually the good letter that I almost never see. You got interactive review, which means in the next 30 days, they believe they'll be able to make a decision. And whenever they say that, it usually means they're gonna make a positive decision. Yes, you're a substantial equivalent and you can market your product. So occasionally you get that interactive review letter, but most of the time you get requests for more information. And that's when we have to respond to each question with additional information and explain our rationale to the FDA. And that's what drags things out to closer to 120 days. The 510K process starts with figuring out what is your product classification and figuring out what would be a suitable predicate to show your device is substantially equivalent to. So one simple way to do it is to type in a keyword into the FDA database to try to find a device like yours. So I've demonstrated this before with some videos, but a typical example, you click on the database that, um, that I've actually put here 
Um, there's actually a whole entire uh, blog that I put in here about FDA device classification. I have the hyperlink here. But you go into that database, you type in something like adhesive, and it'll pull up probably 100 different classifications of adhesives, and you pick the one that sounds most like your device, you read the description, if it matches your product, then you start looking for potential predicates in there that are just like yours for the indication for use and the technological characteristics. The indication for use are the most important. So is it a topical adhesive for um, temporary, um, temporarily bringing um, the issue or the edges of a wound together? So they call it, um, what is it, uh, topical um, approximation of uh, wounds. Uh, that could be an example. It could be something that it's an endoscopic device and it's used for visually imaging inside the body during surgery. Every single device has some indication for it. And what you're trying to do is find one that's just like what you want for the indication for use of your device. Um, it can be made the same way, but if it doesn't have the same indications, you're going to have a problem showing substantial equivalence. Here's actually an example. I think this is actually the adhesive example. So there are actually 42 different adhesive uh, results in this search. Some are class one, some are class two, some are class three. So you could probably narrow it down to, I'm already pretty sure this is a 510K submission, so I'll sort it by class twos, adhesives, give me a short list, and I'll try to find the one that's most similar to what we're looking for. And there's the link at the top for the classification database. Then for the substantial equivalence decision, it's six questions. The first one is, is the predicate device that you selected, somebody else's product on the market that you're saying you're equivalent to, is there legally marketed? If their product was removed from the market and recalled and the FDA will no longer let it on the market, it's not legally marketed. It is possible it was a startup company, they got a 510K and they ran out of money and they never marketed it. That could be used as a 510K, but ideally you want one that's registered and listed and being sold today. So that's question number one. Number two, does your device have the same indication for use? In this case, what I recommend is you copy the indication for use, change the name, and you're done. So then you can say our indications for use are identical. You don't have to do that. You can modify it and make, make slight changes to show how yours is different from the predicate device. But the more changes you make, the higher the risk you fail at question number two. And the result of the answer no is not substantial equivalent, you're done. Question number three, does the device have the same technological characteristics? So I was actually going through a pre-sub yesterday with a client where they have technological characteristics that are different. That doesn't mean no, that just means go on to the next question. So it's not the same technological characteristics. The, the other device was pneumatic. This one was mechanical and electrical. So they work by different means, but they are supposed to both apply pressure was what this product did. Well, the, first, the, the next question, question four, is do the different technological characteristics of the device raise different questions of safety and effectiveness? And I know you're probably having trouble reading this uh, diagram, just click on the link at the top of the page and it takes you to the guidance. But that question gets answered incorrectly sometimes. So a company may say, well, no, this doesn't, address, doesn't create any new issues of risk or the issues of risk aren't different. Uh, if you change a coding from one coding to another coding, you're still going to have biocompatibility issues. Uh, but if you change from pneumatic to electrical or pneumatic to mechanical, those introduce new risk potentially. So um, it isn't always a straightforward answer. In this particular case, another company's already figured out how to get it through with different um, technical characteristics. And so we actually have a path forward and we know exactly how to demonstrate substantial equivalence. But that's usually a tough one for companies that are developing new technology with new features. The next question is, are the methods that you're showing it's uh, safe and effective acceptable? So yes, it's different technology, but is it still safe and effective? How are you gonna validate that? Typically, use one of the standard testing methods that the FDA already recognizes. So electrical safety, EMC testing, software validation, biocompatibility, sterility, uh, sterilization validation. Those are the methods you're gonna use. 
and you're using recognized standards that the FDA identifies for each of those uh, test methods. And then the last question is, does the data demonstrate substantial equivalence? So at the conclusion of every single test report, there should be the conclusion that, yes, this, this shows that it's substantial equivalent and there are no issues, no new issues of risk uh, resulting from the testing. So that's how you de demonstrate substantial equivalence. And when you actually look at how a third party reviewer will actually fill one of these out, they actually circle the, the yes and the no's in the diagram when they make their recommendation. So you can actually find some of those through the Freedom of Information Act when you um, look at somebody else's submission online. This slide tells you a little bit about how we organize and plan projects. We use our table of contents, TOC, as the planning tool. We've tried other methods, but just color coding our table of contents seems to be a really easy solution. So if the document doesn't exist and it's required for the submission, it's red. If it exists, but it needs revisions, it's in progress, it's yellow. If it's blue, that means they need a signature from the client. So the documents we need signatures on are the cover letter, truthful and accuracy statement. Um, uh, there's two others, uh, confidentiality agreement, and potentially you may have a, um, it's called a financial disclosure form. So if you conducted a clinical study, you have a financial disclosure form that needs to be signed as well. So those are the documents that would be blue, needing a signature. And then once all the things are done, then we color code it green. So once everything goes to green, we eliminate the color coding because it's just used by us and we submit it to the FDA as a PDF. So it's very easy for our manager just to look at the table of contents and see how we're doing, like the next page. So you can actually see a, a whole webinar that we did on uh, project management lessons learned. But here's an example of one, and I, I think I just edited out the confidential stuff and put blank your company name and your product name here. But I think this is actually from a project we recently did. And it says, waiting for transfer of payment and payment ID, so the company had not paid their fee yet. The table of contents stays in progress until we're done. They hadn't signed the cover letter yet. Um, the 510K summary was in process, but we were making, making updates to one of the tables that's in another section, the substantial equivalence comparison. In the executive summary, we were using the same table, so it was red for the, or yellow for the same reason. So that gives you an example of how we do the project management using the table of contents. This is probably one of the most important parts of the 510K process is the planning of your testing. And as I said, you wanna do this before you do your pre-sub and then submit it to the FDA as a plan and get their feedback on it. And you ask them specific questions. So it's at the beginning of the design control process, it's at approval of design inputs, you put this plan together and submit it to the FDA as a plan. A lot of companies don't know how to figure out what testing is done, so they just keep on developing their product, but they don't take a step back and say, what testing do we have to pass? One of the ways to find out is to look for a special controls guidance document that might be published on the FDA website. That's one way. And be very careful because they're not always where they should be. For whatever reason, the FDA seems to hide the special controls guidance documents and you have to really hunt for them sometimes. They should be listed at the bottom of every single product classification page. So when you have the three letter product classification, at the bottom it should say what special controls guidance apply. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Sometimes they're on the page for the regulations. Sometimes they're not anywhere um, that's organized by product and you just have to search the guidance database by keywords. And the FDA uses Boolean searches instead of um, much more in, uh, intuitive searches like we're used to with Google with natural language. So therefore it's often very hard to find the right guidance and you really need to ask the FDA in all of your pre-sub meetings, are there any special controls guidance documents that we're missing? Another thing to do is look for specific standards. The FDA will list product specific standards in the classification database. You will also see them listed under each predicate. They'll, they'll say these are the tests we passed. And then you might also see some under the regulations. So there are a lot of places to look. You can also read the 510K summaries from different companies. Um, and then of course you can order 510K submission from other companies and look at their Freedom of Information Act uh, redacted copies. And sometimes that will give you additional clues as to what testing is required. 
So typically, we use all four methods to make sure we figured out what the testing methods are before you even start any testing. I always recommend pre-sub meetings. Uh, two years ago, that wasn't the case. Now, based on some of the changes that were made to guidance documents in 2016, I always recommend this because some of those guidance documents throw companies for a loop and they are they get some testing requirements that they weren't anticipating. So it, it really pays to have pre-sub meetings. Not all of them, unfortunately, are helpful. Sometimes the FDA does not give you helpful information during the pre-subs, but they try to. So I always recommend asking for the pre-subs. Some companies say, well, we don't have a time. Well, you don't really have time to repeat all your testing either, so do the pre-sub. If it doesn't get you useful information, you're really not out anything. You still had to prepare a device description. You still had to come up with a testing plan. You still needed to write your indication for use, and you still needed to come up with draft labeling. Those are the things I include in a pre-sub. So you're not out any extra work. You're just gonna use those documents again in your final submission but getting some feedback from the FDA is better than none. It may save you a lot of money doing tests over again. Um, Pre-sub meetings do not need to be in person. In fact, the FDA prefers to do teleconferences because then they don't have to all be in the same place and they don't have to go through security in another building where they have public meetings. So I recommend always doing teleconferences, but if you happen to be located near the DC area and you wanna go in person, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, if you have a product you can demonstrate and actually bring a sample and show the FDA, it really adds some value. If you can't even bring it with you and uh, it's very theoretical still, it's probably not worth your time. Uh, if you're flying from overseas, probably not worth your time. But I did have a client from New Zealand that really got a lot of value out of being on site, but they brought a clinical expert with them and the whole entire discussion was about their clinical study. So that made sense. Um, make sure you do your homework. Don't ask any questions. Uh, you need to know when to stop asking questions about this particular item and go on to the next item in your agenda. You only have an hour of time for these precept meetings. You don't have as much time as you want, just one hour, no matter whether you show up on site or do it remotely. And some people have even found they get more information when they just ask for an email response. So you have multiple ways to re uh, request information from the FDA, either email, teleconference, or face-to-face. There have been some changes to the RTA process. They released a new guidance this year. The changes were minor, but the checklist is longer now. And even though a couple years ago they said, we're, we're only gonna reject things once, and if we don't resolve it on the first uh, resubmission, we're gonna let the lead reviewer resolve things, that's not the case. We've actually seen them reject it multiple times. Um, and sometimes uh, what they're looking for isn't always obvious or it's a miscommunication. So sometimes it pays to pick up the phone and talk to the lead reviewer or the person that reviewed the RTA and ask a couple of clarification questions before you resubmit uh, and go through the RTA process again. This is one of the guidance documents that actually caused a lot of problems. It's on, we're on slide 14, it's human factors. There was a guidance document released February 3rd of 2016 and I've seen a lot of companies with over-the-counter products run into problems with human factors testing. First of all, they'll often not include the human factors testing, and then when the FDA asks for it, they'll provide something that meets the international guidance 62366. Unfortunately, that's not what the FDA is looking for. They're looking for something that meets their guidance on human factors, which is slightly different from the international standard. One of the things they require 15 users per user group. So if you have both physicians and over-the-counter laypersons, that's two different user groups. You might have um, also, uh, you might have done this study in Europe because your company's located in Europe. So you would do the study, let's say Ireland or do it in the UK where people speak English. Problem is they don't have the same experiences that US uh, people have. And therefore the FDA says, no, those users aren't acceptable. We wanna see users in the US. So that often invalidates all the work that you've done if you've done a usability study in Europe for CE marking. Um, so that's one of the other changes that we see. Another thing that we see is you have to really do a good job of your risk analysis and show the FDA, here are the risks that we identified and here's how we address them in the human factors testing. So if you haven't done your risk analysis and you haven't done a usability study before, 
this is going to be an eye opener and wake up call for your company. So this is one of the areas I've found very helpful to do a pre-sub meeting ahead of time to make sure there are no human factors issues that the FDA wants to see a human factor study for in advance. Um, sometimes we don't ask that question outright. We just say, here's our testing plan. Is anything else required? E-copy hold. Uh, one of the things that I said is uh, during the first like 24 hours, the same day that you submit your 510K, you should get your e-copy acknowledgement that it's been successfully uploaded. Unfortunately, one day in 2016, I had nine of, or not one day, but one week in 2016, I had nine of them get rejected. Three times for three different companies. Uh, it was an absolute disaster and I couldn't figure out what the problem was. Turns out what happened was there was a new Windows update uh, in Windows 10 and it was pushed out and it automatically inserted a system information volume folder that's a hidden system file on every flash drive to help you automatically recover things, but it's not so helpful when you aren't allowed to have it for uploading to the FDA. The FDA sees that file and rejects it because it's not meeting their formatting requirements. So they ask you for a replacement e-copy. So this is actually a picture of the replacement e-copy I sent the first time that it failed and then I submitted again and it failed again. And then I finally figured it out. But I actually wrote a whole article about it. I've presented on it several times. We've solved the problem. I actually created a whole entire brand new business unit out of it called FTA eCopy. And so I have a lot of companies, even some competitor consultants come to me and say, can you do the e-copy for me? So they'll upload the files to me and then we'll e-copy, create the e-copy for them, validate it. We have this little validation software over here on the right of my screen. Um, but you need to make sure that if you're using a flash drive, you do that. If you use a CD-ROM, you don't have so much of a problem, but we're getting to the point where CD-ROM drives are actually hard to find on a laptop. So a lot of companies or people don't even have the, the CD-ROM drive to create this for the FDA. And I find that the, the uh, CD-ROMs aren't quite as durable. They sometimes get scratched or broken. So I prefer to use the flash drives, but you gotta know how to do it right to eliminate that hidden flash or hidden uh, system volume folder. This uh, picture here is from, uh, let's see, it would have been September 28th, no, 27th, I believe. Uh, it would have been the last Thursday before the end of the financial uh, fiscal calendar uh, quarter or fiscal year for the FDA. The FDA works on fiscal calendar years uh, from uh, October 1st through September 30th and people try to get things in before the their small business status expires and they have to renew it and before their uh, fee expires and they have to resubmit it and retransfer. So they'll pay in advance and then they won't have things quite ready and so you get this mad rush at the last minute at the end of the quarter. And this happened to us. We actually had three different submissions going in in the same day. You see four, four flash drives because at the last minute we realized, oh, this, this de novo submission has some statistical data and video files that were put in miscellaneous folders and they're so big that you can't even get them on a regular flash drive that's one gig or two gigs. We had almost four gigs of data there. So we actually had to submit it on a separate flash drive. I asked the FDA eCopy or document control group if this was acceptable. They actually told me if you have really large files, submit multiple copies, multiple e-copies and tell us that in your cover letter. That way we can upload both at the same time and it will upload faster. So they've actually figured out a way to make sure that they can upload both and they won't uh, in interfere with one another and you can actually upload the information faster and that really helps. So this is how we did this one. We actually, that particular day, we had a traditional 510K we submitted that was 20 volumes. We had a special 510K that was one document. Uh, the whole entire 510K was bundled into one PDF. And then we had a de novo that had 21 uh, volumes plus a, uh, a statistical data folder and a miscellaneous folder. So you can see there, each submission is very different. And we had to submit all three of these in one day. And uh, even though that was probably the busiest day I've seen, we've had weeks where that's pretty typical where we go through that much in one week, just not that much in one day. The FDA has uh, new software too. So we've been waiting for a long time. Can we submit our 510Ks electronically? Um, not quite yet. 
they were hoping last year, the year before that was going to happen. Then they decided to redo the entire platform. So they said it's going to take two years. So sometime 2019 is the goal for when they'll have e-submitter ready to submit through an e-submission gateway or an ESG. But right now the software is available. You can download it. It's an e-submitter version three. There are three different options. One, if you're doing an IBD submission, you use template version 1.3. If you're doing a regular submission, it would be version 1.2.1. It creates the e-copy for you. You put it on a flash drive and then mail it in. And then the third possibility is a quick 510K pilot that's using the latest and greatest version that they have, version 3.2. And with that version, uh, it creates a zip folder that includes XML content as well. And uh, I found that one is much, much faster than doing a normal 510K. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that eventually become mainstream. But for right now, it's limited to only a, through, a few of the product classifications. But if you want to learn more about FDA eSubmitter, I provided the hyperlink at the top. The quick 510K pilot, a lot of people want to get involved in that. Unfortunately, it's limited right now to 38 product classification codes. Here are the codes on the screen. I provided a link to an article about it that we wrote. It has basically three advantages. This is why everybody wants to do it. And unfortunately, it's limited because it's pilot. Number one, they're not going to go through the RTA process because the e-submitter software won't let them create it, uh, a submission unless it meets the RTA requirements. So that's great. That means 50% of the submissions that we're getting rejected will not get rejected. Number two, the review is interactive. Normally, they have that first 60 days is a substantial review period. They're going to jump right to interactive review right off the, uh, off the start. And that's because these 38 product cloud categories, they're pretty sure they know exactly what they want, and they feel there are guidances that are appropriate, and the e-submitter software prompts the person for making sure they've uploaded the right things. So that helps quite a bit. And you're, then you're not working with a pre-screener, you're working directly with a lead reviewer who's more knowledgeable and more experienced. And then last but not least, the nice little caveat at the end, 60-day review clock is what they're targeting instead of the 90-day review clock. So it's a faster review as well. So definitely some advantages here, but it's still not an electronic submissions gateway submission. It's still burning it onto a flash drive or a CD and mailing it in. So I just live four or five miles down the road from FedEx and we're sending shipments off to FedEx all the time. And um, so we actually have quite a few companies come to us and pay the $150 to have their e-copy created, validated and shipped off to the FDA same day. And the FDA receives it the following morning. Hey, Rob, I'm interjecting for a moment. Just yes. um, We have hundreds of people on the line. I know your presentation is 34 slides long, so we're just over the halfway mark. It's 40 past the hour. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of uh, administrative notes. One is, if you haven't found it yet, I sent a chat message to everyone uh, that has the link to the slides. Mm -hmm. And I also just sent you a link to Rob's calendar. Uh, I read ahead to the end, and he has a 30-minute offer, uh, free time. I suggest you take advantage of it, and I suggest probably that there are more people who will want it than Rob has time, so it's kind of first come, first serve. I tell you all of this because uh, I respect that many of you have a schedule. You probably have a hard stop in 20 minutes. Rob, I suspect you can stay well beyond the 20 because we've already got quite a, quite a queue of questions. Uh, between this information and the questions, we've probably got at least another 50 minutes in us. So we are recording it. You have the slides. There's a link for Rob's calendar, and we want to make sure that you get everything that you need to support your medical device initiatives. Back to you, Robert. Thank you. This slide, slide 19, is about small business qualification. I find a lot of companies wait until they're actually ready to submit and then say, oh, can we? how do we get the small business discount? You should apply for the small business qualification every year on August 1st. You should not delay, even if you think you might on some remote planet do a 510K submission this next year, do it now. Do it August 1st. Today is October, but... Um, October or August 1st of every year, you should be applying. If you haven't applied already, apply now. Um, 
in the past, they had the forms for it included in the guidance document. Now they provide hyperlinks, so you have to download them. If you're having trouble downloading, can't find them, let me know. I've already downloaded them, and I already found a mistake in their hyperlink, so you may have trouble with the US version. Uh, but I have that, and I can give it to you uh, as a PDF. You have to attach a copy of your tax filing, and if you uh, have subsidiaries in other countries, you're going to have to follow, fill out the international form as well for each of the subsidiaries. And here's the catch. You also have to have the National Tax Authority verify that that number is valid, uh, whatever you put on that form. So for international firms, there's a little more work you have to go through. But for U.S. firms, you just take a copy of your tax filing and submit it to the FDA. And um, they make the decision fairly quickly. They say it could take up to 60 days. So that's another reason why people won't do it. In fact, I've seen people get it in five days. So submit it right away, get it done, and that'll cover for the entire year. And they, depending on when you submit, they accept different tax years. So you want to read the guidance. I also did a webinar on it if you have more questions. But these can be filled out in 15 minutes if you have your tax documentation. And it saves you a bit of money. Here's another guidance document that the FDA slipped in recently, September 6, 2017. We have an interoperability guidance. Um, essentially, what we're looking for here is you demonstrate your device uh, operates properly with other required accessories. So if you list in your device description, we're going to use our device with these following other devices, you have to demonstrate interoperability with those devices. And you have to provide 510K numbers for those other devices, or they have to be included in your submission. So this is one of the things I've found companies recently getting stuck with in a lot of uh, electronic devices, the mobile apps uh, have to show that they have interoperability with the API for that device. So there's definitely some testing that needs to be provided for a lot of electronic devices that are interacting with other instrumentation and uh, gather the information and send it to another place for analysis. Um, for this one, there are actually, this slide actually has two different guidance documents. Uh, one of them is about general changes to devices and when to submit a 510K. The other one is for software. When you make a change to software, do you have to submit a 510K? We actually have a template that we use that's based on these two guidances and you just go through the template and answer the questions. I recently had a client that went through an extensive process where they had letters to file. Instead of submitting new 510Ks, they said, there's no need to submit a 510K and here's why. They filled out the guidance of, or this form that we gave them appropriately. And the FDA inspector that came and looked at this, he said, this is exactly how you're supposed to fill this out. This form is perfect. It follows the guidance exactly. You've done everything you're supposed to and the person passed on the information to the Office of Device Evaluations and said, you know, here's the letters, the file that they have. And they were specifically looking for that because they knew we had made a lot of modifications to our product and they want to know whether um, a new 510K should have been submitted or not. So that's something they look for and you really need to go through that guidance and make sure that you've decided whether it needs to be a new submission or it'll let a letter to file. And the letter to file is in your design history file, not the FDA's file. There is also a little bit of an impact on the 510K process from de novos. In the past, de novo submissions were free. So a lot of companies that had novel devices would try to go down the de novo pathway on purpose instead of the 510K pathway because it was a free process and the 510K wasn't. Now things have switched because the de novo process is uh, has a fee associated with it and it's a much higher fee than the 510Ks. Now I see companies trying to make 510K submissions possible when it's really a de novo. So the FDA, now there's a financial incentive for them to say, no, 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 this is not a de novo, this is a 510K. Um, I'm, say, I'm sorry, they say, no, 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 this isn't a 510K, this is a de novo because it should be charged to higher fees and it should go through the clinical study that's typically required for de novo. It also has a longer timeline. So in the past, it would take anywhere from 180 days to maybe even two years. Um, it's come down gradually. I think the average is around 170 days, but their target under Medufma 4 is to get it down to 150 days. 
for software requirements, I have a lot of companies with software. Um, almost everything that used to be just mechanical now has a software component, is Bluetooth, communicates with things, downloads data. But along with that goes a lot of documentation that has to be submitted with your 510K. And a lot of companies, they will say, well, it works. Why do I have to? This is really simple. It's all firmware. There's no software. Well, the FDA considers firmware software. They consider programmable medical devices software. And they consider anything with app apps or uh, web-based software or in the cloud. It's all software. So the FDA has an international uh, standard, IEC 62304, that they recognize. And they expect you to do testing to that. And the ABC risk categories in 62304 do not match up with the FDA's requirements for level of concern. So you really have to go through each of these three guidance documents, read them, and provide documentation that's appropriate for each of them. And I have seen companies spend an entire year trying to do that. So don't wait till the last minute to learn how to do this. This should be part of your design plan right at the very beginning. And if you thought it was really bad, now you're going to see it gets worse. This slide was produced by Mary Vonner. She's um, really become one of the software experts on my team. And I sent her off for training with software CPR er earlier this year. Brian Pate does a fantastic job of training people. And I sent a lot of clients to him say, oh, you've reached the point where you need somebody to actually write validation protocols. That's not something we do. Um, we can help tell you what things you need to do, but we can't actually do the validation of the software for you. And that's when Brian's team comes in. And this shows all the updated standards as well as the new standards that are coming. So you have four new standards coming for cybersecurity. You see 62304 is going through revision. Both the 14971 and the guidance are being updated. And that impacts everything because everything's risk-based validation. You have lots of links to software for the electrical safety. And the list goes on. Hmm. Please advance. OK. So software documentation. We have a level of concern guidance document, or a level of concern um, is a term that they use in the guidance document. And based on the level of concern, whether it's minor, moderate, or major, determines how much documentation the FDA wants to look at. That doesn't mean you do less. You do the same amount of documentation based on the, the risk of the software. So if it's an A category, it's less documentation. If it's a B category in the 62304, it's going to be a moderate level of documentation. And then you're going to have an extremely large amount of documentation you have to do for the very high risk category Cs. But those don't necessarily match up with minor, moderate, and major for level of concern. And most of the submissions are moderate level of concern. And so I've displayed here what you're typically required to have. And I have companies all the time like, well, what bugs? Software always has bugs. But some of those bugs give you an error message. And then it's OK if it's giving you an error message rather than not telling you that it has a bug. Or sometimes the, the device won't operate if, there's, if the bug is triggered. So you have to look at the unresolved anomalies or bugs. They require a cybersecurity assessment. So we, have a, we actually have a template we fill in for that that references all three of the guidance documents on cybersecurity. We look for traceability analysis. So the FDA really looks very closely for that traceability analysis. That could very easily be a 30 or 40 page Excel spreadsheet for some companies. And we often provide that as one of the miscellaneous documents uh, for the FDA to look at in native file format rather than a PDF. So there's a lot of software documentation, documentation required. And for cybersecurity, we have three different guidance documents just for cybersecurity. And as you can see, one of them was released in 2016, one in 2014, one in 2005. All of these, the FDA asks questions about, and they all want them tied back to risk. And I've had some companies say, well, there's, there's no way for anybody to have cybersecurity with this uh, problems with this device because it's sealed and it doesn't talk to the internet, it isn't Bluetooth, it doesn't have Wi-Fi. It, it, it's completely immune to cybersecurity. Well, nothing's completely immune, but it is true that if somebody has to pull the unit open and reprogram the firmware on your device, it's probably pretty safe. But that is a risk control, not making the device talk with the internet, not having Bluetooth capability and sealing it 
and having all the information on firmware instead of software that you upload with the SD card, those are all risk controls that you need to identify in your risk management. So it doesn't mean that you haven't done it, it just means you haven't documented it and the FDA wants the documentation. Uh, next slide. Okay, now we're into labeling. Uh, UDI, the unique, unique device identifier is a barcode that the FDA requires on products now. It's used for traceability. And all the products are required to have it except for the very low risk class one and unclassified. Those will be required to have it in the future. However, um, the FDA um, the FDA does not require that these UDI barcodes be provided with your 510K submission. So you can get 510K clearance and then later on add the barcode. That's perfectly acceptable. Uh, but you, you have to have the barcode on there when you commercialize the product. So the submission doesn't need it, but you do need it for commercialization. Uh, this is a diagram that shows you what all the different parts of the UDI code are and the label are. And then this next slide here, uh, I actually have a hyperlink embedded in here for the UDI help desk if you're looking for that. But uh, essentially, if you ever have a question about UDI, the best thing to do is to email the help desk and you'll get a response back answering your question. And that's usually how I answer most of my clients' questions about UDI. Um, and you're required to have that. The biggest challenge coming up is in the near future is we're going to have to actually have it on physical devices rather than just on the label. And that's for some of the instruments. So it isn't here yet as a requirement. They said the next deadline was September 24th, 2018. Some of those enforcement deadlines have been pushed out. So we have a little bit more time, but that's coming and that's going to be a real nightmare for a lot of orthopedic companies. We have the biocompatibility guidance. This is the other really big headache for companies. A lot of uh, submissions since 2016 have required pre-subs. The reason why is the you have the ISO standard, the international standard for 10993-1, but then you have the FDA guidance that's different. They added additional endpoints for testing that they want you to consider. And uh, the, the table is slightly different and they've, also giving you some guidance as to what uh, rules they want you to use when you're extracting things. So they want you to do most things by uh, surface area rather than by volume or, or rather than by mass. So uh, you really need to read through that guidance document and make sure you comply with it. And so companies are recommended to have a biological evaluation plan up front, submit that with their pre-sub and actually invite their, their biocompatibility experts from whatever test house they're using to participate in this conference call and answer any of the FDA's questions. If the FDA agrees to the plan, then you execute it and then you submit a biological evaluation report at the end with your submission, along with all the test reports. And you have to provide the full test reports. What I see a lot of companies do, particularly European CE Mark products, they'll do everything according to 10993. They won't look at this guidance document. They'll submit summaries instead of full test reports and they'll get rejected at the RTA screening. So you really need to make sure you do this. And there is a brand new standard that was released in August. The FDA is currently reviewing it for the recognition process. So sometime around in March, I'm gonna be contacting them again. It's not gonna be recognized probably between now and March, but sometime next year, it's gonna get recognized. And there are some differences between that and the guidance. So we really need to look at that and its impact. So you really want to be looking at uh, the new standard as well in considering how it's gonna affect your testing that you might've planned. Um, the, in the RTA screening, there are some specific questions, so you need to answer those. We have a template that addresses each of those, but here are the questions they ask in the RTA screening. And then you have the new 10993 guidance. No longer does it say you have to do these tests, and instead it says you're required to do physical and or chemical characterization of your product, and then consider the following endpoints, and they've added five new endpoints. They've also added six new definitions. So you can see from these definitions, they're now considering nanomaterials, non-contacting, so indirect contact. So if you have a liquid that's the product and it's in a bottle, that the contents of the bottle itself could be indirectly contacting because your liquid extracts materials from that liquid bottle. Uh, if you have a uh, respirator or uh, humidifier product, 
It can have the gas indirectly contact all kinds of components that could indirectly have effect on biocompatibility and exposure to the lungs. So those all need, need to be addressed. They also talk about transitory contact and they specifically give the example of uh, syringes and needles. So you should look at those as well. The FDA is sometimes considering these as acceptable um, approaches, but you, if you're gonna follow this new standard before they recognize it, you need to put together a biological evaluation plan, submit it to them in the pre-sub and get their agreement before you do any testing. That brings us to the end of the presentation, right at uh, the end of the time. Like um, Joe said, if you, have, uh, if you have some questions that are uh, confidential in nature, set up a meeting with me and I'd be happy to answer your questions if you need more time. Uh, if it gets uh, so you need like hours of my time, I'll, I'll set up an appointment with you and um, tell you up front how much uh, it will cost you for my time. But I give you three, 30 minutes of free time to answer any of your questions. And all you have to do is go in there and schedule an appointment. I have a question. Sure. Actually, I have a dozen questions. Okay. First one comes from Pierre. Do we need GLP testing to submit an application for a clinical trial? First, tell us what GLP means. Uh, GLP is good laboratory practices. Um, clinical studies are GCPs, good clinical practices. So we're kind of mixing acronyms here and applicability requirements. If you are doing something that is a simple, straightforward chemical or physical test, that you can do on a bench top, like the weight, the dimensions, the pH. Those are things you can do in your lab yourself and you don't need to have a GLP report. If you are doing biocompatibility testing, such as skin irritation, which is typically an animal test on small rodents, those are typically done by labs that are animal labs. They have a lab director that signs off on the protocols. You sign off on the protocol. They have monitoring of the animals. And those are done under GLPs. And if your report doesn't specifically say GLP, you will get a request from the FDA to please either amend your report or provide explanation for why you weren't doing these under GLPs because it's required. And then if you are doing a clinical study on humans, you need a GCP uh, being followed, good clinical practices. In this case, you have to have a protocol. They'll require the protocol to be submitted with the submission, including the summary report. They always want to see the raw data too, so you usually have a special folder with the statistical data. And then on top of all that, you have to have the financial disclosure form for the company showing no conflicts of interest that's signed, and then one for each of the investigators and any minor investigators that supported the effort. So lots of attestation and signatures showing that it's okay. But uh, the the blanket statement that GLPs are required is very rarely true for all testing. In fact, the FDA actually has a guidance document out as a draft telling you how to write a report if you're gonna do the testing yourself. I'm smiling like this because A, I've never seen you stumped, and B, you just overwhelmed us with an answer to what was a straightforward question. So really uh, do not disappoint. Uh, Bernard asks, in fact, extra credit for anyone who can stump Rob <laughs> with a question he cannot answer. Well, that's answer. when I bring in Mary. I got stumped earlier today by a call. <laughs> okay. Well, I've not seen it. Bernard asks, are there usability studies with patients? Do those fall under clinical studies? And before you answer, I'll just remind everyone, it is the top of the hour. If you have to go, we understand completely. We are recording, and we will get the recording to you. So... Usability studies patients, do those fall under clinical studies? Um, the human, the when you have a patient that you're treating for the indication for use, it's now a clinical study. It could be a significant risk study where you need an IDE or you're doing it outside the US. An IDE is an investigational device exemption, which the FDA approves, or you could have a non-significant risk, non-significant risk clinical study which does not require the FDA approval, but does require an IRB, in Institutional Review Board approval. So if you're working with patients, you need approval either from an ethics committee in Europe, an IRB in the US, or the FDA for an IDE. If you are not treating patients for the indication for use, now it's a simulated use study, 
and that's what a human factor study is. Now, that being said, if you're doing a clinical study anyway, you could provide a rationale to the FDA why you don't need to do human factors testing because the usability will be proven to be adequate in the clinical study. That being said, why wouldn't you do a simulated use study for human factors before you spend a million dollars on a study that might be jeopardized because your human factors suck? So I recommend doing the simulated use study first before you do a clinical study, but you could rationalize why that's not required. And um, that I think answers all the question, but if I missed a part while I was talking too much, uh, just schedule a time with me and I'll answer your question. I just sent out the slides again for those who didn't find the chat box earlier. Susan asks, for 510k submissions, what isn't online that we might be able to get through the Freedom of Information Act? <laughs> what other good resources are out there? When you, when you look online, they'll either have a 510k summary or a statement. The statement says, sorry, we've, you have to request it directly from the company, and they will provide you a redacted copy within 30 days. If they didn't, if they did that, all you're going to get is the indication for use and a letter from the FDA that's a form letter. It doesn't help you. Option number two, they put in a 510k summary. This is what most people are familiar with. You get the indication for use, which is form 3881, and then you get this summary from the company that the FDA has approved the content of, but it basically says this is what testing they submitted. Most companies go out of their way to provide as little helpful information as possible in that. Sometimes the FDA uh, nips that in the bud and says, no, you have to at least provide this information. And they've gotten better about making sure companies are more consistent about what information they provide in that 510k summary. If the file has already been requested multiple times through the Freedom of Information Act, you may be able to get right on the FDA website the FOIA data, and it'll be in a PDF format, and you'll see um, you'll see most of the device description, but you won't see any technical details. You won't see any test reports, but you'll see parts of the executive summary. You'll see uh, the table of contents. You might see other documents. Sometimes they do a poor job of redacting and you get more than you're supposed to get. Um, but you get a lot of information, including the labeling. You get the, all the labeling for the product, which is really helpful uh, because you're supposed to actually submit the labeling of a predicate. But you don't get everything, and you especially don't get any test reports or specifications because those are confidential. In order to get those, you're, you really are out of luck. The only way you could really get test data is to do it yourself. You, you buy one of the devices yourself and test it. But you might be able to figure out what test standards they tested against, and that might be helpful to you because the test methods might give specifications on testing and pass-fail criteria. Another thing that you can do is look specifically for uh, redacted copies that had a third-party review. Anything, Anytime you go through the third-party review process, there's more information available in the summary done by the third-party reviewer than you would typically see in a redacted 510K. And so those are especially helpful. But uh, there are... If you want a spec or you want a test report result, you're out of luck. Cecile asks a related, how long will it usually take to receive the 510K submission through the Freedom of Information Act? Um, the fastest I've ever seen is days, but the norm is uh, six months, and I have seen two years. And wow. I do know that there That's are helpful. some firms you can hire that if they have it in their database, you can get it very fast to them. So always ask if they have it. What and, kind of firm? Uh, what would I Google for that? FOIA services. I think that might actually be the name of one of the companies. I think uh, so too. But they're, they're located in Washington, D.C. They actually go into the reading room and they actually request the documents and copy them. Um, but it does take a while to get those documents. And so if they haven't already requested and they don't already have it, it's going to take a while. Okay. Catherine asks, for pre-sub meetings, should you state what tests you think you should do and ask if you have missed anything? That's essentially what I do. Straightforward, does it make sense? That, that is essentially what I do. I have a template, 
covering all the different requirements for testing, and then I'll um, say some are not applicable if they're not applicable to that type of device. Uh, but I may have specific questions. Uh, a good example for, of that would be um, somebody had recently asked me if we were going to do shelf life testing for a product, can we use a smaller size product? Because the, the cost of the product is fairly expensive, we want to use less of it. And you have to provide a scientific rationale for that. So that would be a great time when you want to ask the FDA, we want to do this shelf life testing according to this method. However, we want to modify the test samples in the following way. Would that be sufficient? That's a perfect use of your pre-sub meetings. Same thing with the FDA. If you uh, are biocompatibility with the FDA, if you wanted to use the brand new test that's available out there that's a toxicology test for, or like an in vitro test for hemolysis, instead of killing dogs, which is essentially what you're doing when you do the hemolysis test with dogs, it's, it, I think I have the right test, but it's a, it's a test with dogs and it's for blood compatibility and it's, it's a nasty test that nobody really wants to do. And unfortunately, we don't have really good substitutes until recently, but it's not approved. So you want to submit that plan to the FDA to use this alternate test method and you save some animals. It doesn't really cost more money to do it that way. It takes probably even maybe less time. And so you should really consider, hey, we have this alternate test method we'd like to propose to the FDA. Is this acceptable? And that's what the purpose of the precept is for. You also want to ask, is there any problems with this uh, predicate we've chosen. So the FDA in a precept I had yesterday said, we recommend that you look at this other predicate, not necessarily because you should choose it as your predicate, but because they really did a good job of explaining how to um, evaluate technological differences. And we think you, you'll you need to go through the same process. So that was very helpful. Um, and then we asked about some changes in test method. And um, so it was very helpful to hear back from the FDA, uh, their feedback on the test method, hear their feedback on the predicate that we had chosen. So, um, but essentially, yes, the, the answer to your question is, yeah, I, I say, this is what we plan to do. Do you have any feedback on the test plan? But the more specific your questions are about certain tests, the higher the quality of the feedback you'll get. I'm just sending a note to everybody uh, at, um at 10X for Design and Manufacturing just two weeks ago, uh, I met Doug Fankel from Structural Integrity Associates. Uh, he was a presenter and I learned that he does simulations um, for folks who otherwise would be doing animal tests. I don't think he obviates the need for animal tests, but he gets you a lot further along. Um, and I think it not only saves you money, but saves uh, some young lives of little critters there's, that we love. There's definitely been some uh, finite element analysis and other simulations that the FDA has accepted as testing instead of animal testing in human testing. So that, that's definitely a great point, a good way to save some money, get the test results faster, and sometimes the FDA will accept it uh, when the technology is fairly well understood. I'm going to give you a second email address. This is for Arlen Ward, and he is also uh, someone who does uh, simulations um, that can help you save some time and money. Okay, next, Rick A asks, 15 persons per user group is for summative evaluations, but I guess eight to 10 persons per user group is for formulative, formative, pardon me, formative evaluations, is that right? Um. This is when I pull out the guidance document and read it again so I don't say something stupid. So I think you got somebody that stumped me here. Oh, no. <laughs> but when somebody's you... asking questions about the differences between uh, summative and formative studies, they're not, they're not a rookie. <laughs> okay. So what does she win? Um, you stumped Rob Packard. You win a you know, new car. Give me, a, give me a call and give me an email and you can always ask. Maybe I'll say yes. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Congratulations to Rick A. Olsen from Sweden, if my memory serves, or maybe it was Denmark. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and I, do have, I do have a few biocompatibility, I'm sorry, um, 
human factors experts that can definitely answer that question. But when we get into the technical stuff like that, um, I try not to go off my knowledge plateau and I try to say, let's get the best in the world. And yep. so usually okay. the person we're calling is the best in the world. This is a quick one. Uh, Steve notes that your email is at the domain 1345 cert. He wants to know if you are equally knowledgeable in ISO. Um, I can probably say that um, I only have about 10 people in the world that know more about 1345 than I do. And that's because they wrote the standard. <laughs> and I'm not about, sure I'm in that same category with 510Ks yet. But maybe in a few years when I'm doing 10% of the 510Ks. Well, what about all the other ISOs? Oh, the, the 1345 is the is what I really know a lot the about. Mac Daddy the other one of is just Apple. Okay. Well, you. <laughs> 9001, I know enough to be pretty pretty uh, good. I I've actually taught lead auditor courses on 9001, um, but that's a general quality system certificate. 1345 is specific to medical devices, and Let's if you're still paying for 9001, you probably are wasting your money. Let's go with, if you have an ISO question, ask Rob, and he'll ask smarter grown-ups if he doesn't have the answer. That's a Susan, good plan. Susan just wants me to know that she lives on Hage's Lane. And that wow. the builder in the area, his last name is Hage, and if I lived in Nova Scotia, there's a pretty good chance I'm related. I don't, I don't know that Hage. In fact, I didn't know of any other Hages until the internet when I Googled my name and there were these other rogue Joe Hages, but I have since dispatched them on Google and now I'm the only Joe Hage that matters. Carrying on, Kat Gabaris asks, if there is time, can you explain some of the pitfalls and advantages to bundling 510Ks? When are they appropriate, when aren't they? This is a really good question. That um, We could spend a lot of time on it, but I'll spend a little bit of time. And um, you can spend 30 minutes on it with her if she yes. makes an appointment. Um, so I had a company that had about 20 dental adhesive type products that they wanted to bundle together. Uh, you can't do that. Um, it's not the number that's the problem because Mary one of my employees, Mary Vodder, has hit, I believe, hit the world record for 300 plus. So you can bundle hundreds of products in one submission. I don't recommend it. Mary will never try it again. <laughs> but she definitely set the record. And she did it with multiple submissions. She did bundling like that. But when you have 20 dental products, you want to go by product classification and regulation. If they're not in the same product classification and they're not in the same regulation, you can't bundle them. That's the official rule. Um, if they are, if you're doing reprocess devices and they're not from the same OEM, you can, if they're the same classification, the same regulation, but you have to have a separate indication for use page for each OEM because your indications have to match their indications and it's unlikely they're all identical. Um, in general, if you have technological characteristics that are different, you're going to have to demonstrate the substantial equivalence differently for each one, so it's going to be hard. And it'll be a very complex submission that's going to take a long time to get through. So, yes, you're going to save yourself a little bit of money because you don't pay the user fee twice or three times. But, honestly, that's not the big cost here. Usually time is more valuable than money. So do yourself a favor. If they aren't really similar, and they're uh, even though they're in the same product classification, the same regulation, if they're not really similar in terms of technological characteristics, you probably should not be bundling them. That being said, if you're talking about different sizes, that's a no-brainer. No, different sizes is not even considered a bundled submission. It's when they're truly different models of the product and different configurations that we, we consider that a bundled submission. A public shout out to Kira, who has my Twizzlers in the office, and she will hide them because I don't know when I'm going to be in next. Otherwise, they would all have been eaten. I'm very it. jealous. I love Twizzlers, but I'm gluten-free, and they don't have gluten-free Twizzlers. Kat has a quick follow-up. What, what if you want to bundle a system, for example, a monitor, cord, handle, and insert? None of them work on their own. They all have to be connected in order to function as intended. That's, that's not actually considered a bundled submission. It's considered a system. 
and you list all the applicable product codes that are part of that system, but it's considered one uh, system. And yes, you can absolutely do that, and many products do. Uh, orthopedic products do it as a system. Endoscopic uh, imaging systems do it as a system. Um, a lot of dental products. There are many, many products that are done as system submissions, but you have to list all the product classifications that apply to that system. You may have to provide multiple predicates if nobody's bundled them the way or put together that system the way you are. But most of the time you can find somebody else that did a system just like yours out there. And uh, that's part of the trick of picking a predicate is to go through the, all the product classifications until you find one that's most similar to yours. There are a lot of really good questions queued up here. I don't know how to choose among them. Uh, I like to typically cut these off at 90 minutes, but if you're up for it and you still have well over 120 people on the line. Uh, I can you know, I can give you another 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Um, Cecile uh, wants access to your template on uh, assessing device changes if you need to submit a 510k. Is that something you make publicly available or is that something that you'd like a little bit of coin for your time and effort? Um, Mary created that. We do have a webinar on that that we charge for that I think is very reasonably priced. Okay. Um, What's the webinar uh, address? Uh, the webinar... Are it, they it all at the same place? All our webinars are on the webinars page of our website. So it's medicaldeviceacademy.com uh -huh. and then forward slash webinars. And webinar or webinars? I believe it's plural webinars, uh, but I, I can't be 100% certain. Okay, so well, webinar. I sent it out with webinars to everybody if they want okay. to have quick access to that. And on that is one talking about uh, device modifications. It's in the hardware software it, uh, webinar that we did. That, and that's when we developed it. So okay. uh, that would come with that webinar. And it, I know it's under 100 bucks. It might be 49, it might be 29, something like that. It's a bargain at twice the price. My buddy, Ed Lynn, you remember Ed from 10X? Mm -hmm. He asks, if a usability study for uh, an MD or RN shows the product is somewhat difficult or complex to use, but not inordinately difficult, have you passed or failed the usability test? Um, the usability test is not typically a pass-fail for the whole entire test. Normally, you have very specific risks that you are identifying. So you're supposed to do the risk analysis first and then have those risks be assessed during the human factors testing. Um, if you find something like this one, this indicator light is hard to see would be a good example. So you might have a blinking LED, it goes from green to red, and that might be hard for somebody to see. You might have another indicator that you can give the person, like typically you'll have a visual alarm and an audible alarm. If they're able to read the, if they're able to hear the audible alarm, but they're having trouble seeing the visual LED, then you say in the instruction for use that the audible alarm is the primary alarm uh, and the LED is a redundant alarm um, but it may be somewhat dim in a dark environment uh, or somebody that has trouble seeing. So you, you should always indicate, you know, yes, this is a risk. We didn't, we didn't have 100% of the people say that they were adequately able to see the LED, but because we have another alarm that also works and they didn't have problems with that, then it passes. The, the risk controls are adequate. But if that were the only alarm that you had and it was really critical, you might have a problem. And so in those cases, what you would do is you would make a brighter alarm, uh, a, a brighter LED. Or you may say, you know, maybe an LED wasn't the best choice because this is for a person with uh, that can't really see or the environment is not suitable for it. Uh, if it's a, an audible alarm, there's so many alarms in an OR they can't always hear them. So maybe you, you don't, rely on audible alarms, you have rely on a pop-up showing up on a screen of a device. So it, you really have to take it, it is not a, a yes or a no. Typically there are multiple risk controls that have been implemented and you have to provide a justification for the FDA why you feel your solution was good enough 
in what changes you might make based on feedback from simulated use. Hopefully it's just changes to your IFU or instructional views, but sometimes you have to actually make design changes based on what you hear from people and then go back and retest to make sure, hey, it still works. I think I know the answer to this one, but I'll let the expert answer. Joseph Hale, who wonders if FDA guidance during a pre-sub is binding. Uh, they say right up front that it's non-binding. I got it right. <laughs> yeah, but um, that be. I just had this discussion today with a company that was talking about clinical studies, and if you don't ask the question, um, and question? you end up if you don't ask the FDA a question during a pre-sub meeting, mm -hmm. and then you do your testing, and then you have to redo the testing, you might have wasted tens of thousands of dollars. So. I would rather hear from the FDA that we we really want you to do it this way and hopefully avoid that extra testing. Um, but it is true that there are many people that are unsatisfied with their answers from the FDA and feel it was a waste of their time. But for and everyone to do it themselves, three that save ten grand or more. Mm -hmm. Then they go do it the way they want to do it, and then find out that no, they were serious. Yeah. I've I've seen that too where but you if at least you know they disagree with you right up front and so you'll be a little bit more prepared to argue against them. Lois wants to know, do we need to submit the maintenance and repair manual as part of the labeling? Um usually yes. Um usually if the user is going to be doing the repairs of a device or service of a device yes normally that would be included if it's not done by the user so let me give an example if you have a an insulin pump the user typically replaces batteries so you have to have that explanation in there and you have to explain how to troubleshoot the device plus insulin pumps are unique in that they are very high risk if you have a device like an MRI machine, um, you're going to have some have a special manual for the bio the um, the um, biomeds in the hospital to do maintenance on those devices. So most devices, yes, you provide the user manual and, and, and maintenance manual. But if it's not maintenance that the user or biomed would do, and it's done by your company, no, you don't. Uh, Melissa, thanks you for this presentation, and so do I. We still have some questions. I'd like to ask of the audience, um, uh, relative to other uh, webinars that you've had this year, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being this was absolutely the best one, how would you rate this webinar? So you can just type in a number. If you go, ha, Lois gives you a 20 out of 10. So I <laughs> That's the highest score I've ever gotten. It's my new yeah, gold standard. Yes, it is. Melissa wants to know for substantial equivalence in decision number four, mm -hmm. can we reference a different device from our predicate that is 510 cleared but has a different intended use? What is um, decision number four? I'm decision curious. Decision number four is do the technological characteristics of this device introduce new risks? Mm -hmm. And some people, for instance, if, if I have a whole bunch of hip implants with a coating and I want to put that same brand new coating on a shoulder implant, I could use the hip implants for my shoulder submission as a reference device. So, yes, that would be a case where you can use a reference device. Um, it's not a predicate. It's a reference device in that particular usage. Uh, in the substantial equivalence guidance document goes through some good examples in the back that you should read on how to do that. And that strategy should be articulated in your pre-sub meeting. That was exactly part of the discussion we had yesterday is, you know, we understand the technological characteristics of this are more like this other device with different indications. Should we use that as a reference device? And they said, um, you can or you can use this other strategy we discussed. So we had a couple options, but they did say, yes, you could, you could reference that other device and its technological characteristics. And it to help your substantial equivalence argument in question number four. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask of the audience, if you have a question for Rob, and there is still plenty, uh, that you submitted by the bottom of the hour, by 10.30 Pacific, three minutes from now, and then we'll cut it off there, because they still trickle in. 
Uh, and about the ratings, I do have some bad news for you, Rob. Uh, you did get two nines, so okay. there, there is room for improvement. There always is, and yes, I, there is. I would have, e I would have even taken the a three or a four if somebody really was not getting what they were hoping they were getting, and those people would have hopefully left resolved already. that in they, a, they left a long time ago. Joe Wells <laughs> from Acuro Technology says that she is a small company. They're applying for 510K. Mm -hmm. uh, they are the manufacturer. However, if our company or product is absorbed by a larger company down the road, then the owner of the device uh, will change hands. How will that impact the 510K approval? What happens when a cleared device changes hands? How does FDA react to this? So she doesn't spell it out specifically, but I'll add a nuance. What happens if you're in the middle of a 510K submission and you get bought out? Does that matter? Um, it shouldn't matter at all if you're in the middle of the 510K, but I've never actually had that happen. Um, of course, it, I have had some companies, I have actually have one client recently where they were going through the due diligence process and the outcome of the 510K was clearly going to impact whether they were bought and how much the price was going to be. That makes sense. But if you were bought now because they didn't want to wait for the outcome and they were betting the farm on you uh -huh. and didn't want somebody else to get the bidding war, if they did that, um, the ownership of the 510K through the whole process would still remain with the official correspondent and the, and the sponsor of the 510K submission. In order to have it change, this, the official contact for the 510K submission has to send a, uh, a formal letter to the FDA telling them to change the contact and contact a new person. So you can keep it going the way it is, but now under the new ownership, whoever that new company is will legally own the device if that was included in the scope of the purchase agreement. Uh, usually you purchase all the assets, so that would be considered definitely an asset. And then there's a formal process the FDA has for transferring the ownership to the new owner operator um, for the company. And um, all that stuff is typically done during the registration and listing. So if this is your first 510K, you don't even have a registration and listing yet. But if you have registration and listing, you'd add that new 510K to yours, and then you would do a transfer over to the new owners. And they have a process for that. Um, if you have, Let's say you had a 510K that you got last year and you had a warning letter or something. Usually if that warning letter is related specifically to that product with a 510K, the warning letter will have to be resolved uh, anyway, even though you've switched ownership. And the FDA often uh, will trigger an inspection whenever a company is acquired. So if you get bought, the new owner should anticipate a, an FDA inspection pretty soon. Okay. There are five questions left. Um, Aaron asks, if we want to do a 510K amendment. They want to add a test modality to the current product. Is it just as much work to do an amendment as a full submission? How do we do an amendment? I suspect that's a longer answer and a 30 minute conversation, but if you can enough. Um, the special 510K was designed designed as a type of 510k for small changes. So depending on the amendment, that might be a suitable process. Um, otherwise, it would be a traditional 510k or an abbreviated 510k, which has nothing to do with the extent of the change, has to do with the organization of the submission. So typically, you would either do a special 510k or traditional. Small amendments would just be um, probably a special 510k, but it is all dependent on what she's doing, and she might not need a 510K at all. Okay. That sounds like a, an offline check with Robin. He might be able to guide you directly. Olaf asks, what level of detail should a test plan be when presented in a pre-submission? We've structured about two to 300 tests, which is obviously too much to look through in a few minutes. Will I just present the test headers EMC testing, electrical safety testing, device performance testing, alarm testing, and so on. Is that sufficient or how much do we give? Um, 
the level of detail I typically provide is I'll have one line item for electrical safety and EMC testing that'll list 6601-1 and dash one dash two. Then I'll have another section that will list other standards that might be applicable under the 6601 series, such as an alarm standard or an LED, I'm sorry, um, uh, an electrode test, something like that. There might be some specific product specific tests that I have to do for electrical safety, but it's usually at the level of the standard. I don't typically go into details of the test method or the standard unless I'm asking the FDA for input on a change in test method that's specific to my product. I, I don't want to do it the normal way. I want to do it a different way. To actually get into the details of all the tests that are required under each one of those standards is too much detail. Okay. And if you already know the if you already know everything you need to know about several tests, you could say, and of course we'll do the other tests, but we don't have any questions about it. One of our question askers had to go, so we're down to two questions. Cecile asks, will the FDA lead reviewer of the pre-submission be the same lead reviewer for the 510K submission? For pre-submissions, you tend to get uh, you don't tend to get a very green reviewer. You tend to get a better lead reviewer or a senior reviewer, and they do try to have the same person be the reviewer of your 510K. But the longer the time goes by, the more likely it is the person will be promoted or transferred or leave the FDA. So no guarantees, but it is likely. You also get the branch chief typically participates in the pre-subs. So my, my meeting yesterday with the FDA was the senior lead reviewer for that type of product who had actually looked at the predicate and also the branch chief and that was it and so i had the decision maker and his boss right in on the call so that's that's why the precepts are really great whereas if we just submitted we're going to go through potentially a screener that does the rta screening and then the lead reviewer so um it, it really helps to to get it to those people early in the precept process okay 95 minutes later, we come to our last question from Steve, who says, now that MD SAP is a reality, do you recommend keeping ISO 1345 certification if you have an MD SAP, as other markets require ISO 1345? Yes, um, 1345 is just part of the MD SAP program, and I, I would not waste my time uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't waste my time to do all that work on MD SAP and drop the 1345. You're only talking about a very small difference in the cost of certification, getting two certificates. So I would definitely do both. Um, and anybody that's doing MD SAP, the only market that's requiring it is Canada. So unless you're a Canadian company only doing work in Canada, I find it hard to believe that you're just going to do MD SAP. Um, I think that most companies would do MD SAP because they're doing CE marking, they're doing Australia, New Zealand, um, Japan, Brazil, and those markets still expect 1345 to be your base certification. So I, I haven't I haven't even heard of somebody ask the question before. I, I don't really see a lot of value except you're saving maybe a, a few bucks and not paying the extra cert. Okay, raising the roof, Robert. Okay. And extra credit to Rike, who I think you owe a car to for asking a question that you could not answer. Yes, yes. We should have, we should have agreed on the terms up front. Well, then then I would have uh, yeah, maybe probably different. pulled out my standard and looked it up. But okay. we'll see what he asked for. I might be able to provide it for free. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Packard. I can hear the applause in my ears. I don't know if you could hear it. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Joe. I will uh, wrap this up and uh, uh, put it online. And by end of day, everyone will have a link to this broadcast. For Joe Hage and Robert Packard, this is Joe Hage signing off. Make it a great day. Bye-bye.